speaker is Mark Catlin, who is the head of Occupational Health and Safety for the Service Employees Union. Mark. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's always an honor to be here at ADAO and participate in this conference and, um, and, and be energized by this. This is probably the best conference that we attend all year long in our occupational safety and health work. So the, the role that we wanna do today is to sort of give an example of the role of organized labor in kind of dealing with trying to control asbestos exposure. And, um, but before we give you the example of the story we wanna tell today, just learned last week that unions in Sweden in the 1950s, there's evidence that they started pushing alerts about asbestos hazards in shipyards that led in the early 60s to an actually elimination of use of asbestos in shipyards in some parts of Sweden. And so there's, there's a deeper story here, I think, about the role of unions and their members in identifying and fighting the asbestos battle before we uh, thought was probably really taking place. Okay. Um, I have two, two of our members from SEIU with us here today to tell their story, Rob Smith and Teresa Eli, and you'll be hearing from them in a minute. SEIU represents two million workers across the US and Canada, uh, lots of healthcare workers, lots of building service workers, and lots of public workers. Many of these folks get exposed to asbestos. Rob and Teresa are custodians at a, at a school district in Michigan, and you'll hear their story soon. But I wanna go back in history. If we go back about 35 years, and this was, uh, this is a short clip of an alert that was sent out by our then international president, John Sweeney. And uh, SEIU had been concerned about the exposure of, of workers in, uh, of school custodian workers to asbestos. And the union was concerned enough to be starting a campaign and this was the initial kickoff to our leaders and our members about what we were gonna do. 1983. I asked several of our department heads to work with the research department and our public relations agency to try to determine the full extent of the problem, not only with regard to our members who work in schools, but with regard to school children in general and with other categories of SEIU members. Quite frankly, I had been under the impression, as I suspect many of you may be, that our problems with asbestos were taken care of 10 years ago when we all discovered what a killer it can be. We have now learned enough to know that that isn't the case. 1983. So, so the campaign that SEIU uh, started to work with other unions and other organizations on to deal with asbestos in schools and, and in a broader way uh, resulted a few years later in the passage of the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act to deal with asbestos in schools. And that I think was a, a pretty strong piece of legislation that led to lots of changes in, in school districts. Al at the same time, we also were pushing with many other unions and organizations to, to update and strengthen the asbestos, uh, uh, the OSHA asbestos standard in this country to update it and to do better protection of all workers, not just school workers. And and then that culminated in sort of this push by lots of organizations on trying to ban asbestos in 1989. And although we got a partial ban and lost, we didn't get the entire thing. I think by 1991, 92, we had thought that we had a pretty good framework in place to handle uh, you know, a reduction of imported new materials and, and installation of new materials and that we'd had a handle on the control of asbestos in place and its disturbance and exposure to workers and others. Um, but if we jump forward in time, and if, if Rob and Teresa would head this way, if we reach forward in time in, in the past several years, we hear increasing complaints from our members and our local unions that facilities are not complying with longstanding requirements that are in place by various agencies, that our members are told by the supervisor that asbestos isn't present, that it's been banned and doesn't exist anymore, and contractors are often hired who have a history of lots of violations. So, so given that, I wanted to sort of give a brief, uh, give our two members a chance to give you a brief description of the experience they've had over the past couple of years in sort of fighting an issue of asbestos. Teresa first. Hi. You guys are gonna have to pardon me, I'm a little short, even with the heels on, so I apologize if the microphone's off. My name is Teresa Eli. I am a third generation worker for Dearborn Heights School District number seven schools. 
My father is a plant engineer, and my grandfather was actually hired as the first custodian as the buildings were being built. So that is something I'm very proud of. Um, I went to school there. We lived there. I married my husband, who also graduated from Annapolis High School. And it's a very small community. Um, in 2011, uh, I was tasked with going into a school during the summer and getting the classrooms ready for the kids to come back in the fall. And part of that process is, is to clean the classrooms out of the furniture and re redo the floors. I had no idea that they were asbestos tile floors in 2011. When I walked into the classrooms and it was the whole wing, all I thought of as a custodian was, oh my goodness, this is a lot of dust. I've never seen this much dust. This is gonna take a while. Um, the next year, in 2012, we were working at our only high school and my coworker, Rob Smith and I, were upstairs at Annapolis High School while we had summer school going on downstairs. And we also had a reduced cost lunch program going on. So there were members of the community also coming in and out of the building as we were working. It was very hot in Michigan that year. We broke records. And um, Rob, stand, we, were to, we were told that instead of using the wet method, which is what we normally would use to strip the wax off of these floors and a hydro scrubbing machine, that we were gonna use a floor sander because it went faster. Okay, well, I, not quite sure about this, so I asked to call my supervisor, whom actually was a close family friend and has known me since I was a child. And um, the supervisor said, nope, that everything should be fine. And we fired that sander up and we sanded. And boy, did we sand. We sanded for two and a half to three weeks. And within 10 minutes of firing up that 3,500 RPM floor sander on that floor tile, you couldn't see in the room. It was a whiteout. As a matter of fact, the only way to get Rob's attention, who was sanding, to tell him, Rob, we're taking a break, because I was the one that was cleaning up afterwards, was to find the plug underneath the chalkboard and pull the cord to the sander so that it would stop running, so that Rob realized, hey, it's break time. We left footprints going down the hall we piled up all the furniture as we normally did um, in the hallways because we knew the classrooms clear when we're working. And when we would come downstairs to take our breaks, we would see these beautiful little graffiti messages that every high school kid likes to write in the dust, actually. Some of them profane, some of them not. But anyways, um, we ended up finding out um, that, the, that uh, what we did was very wrong, and we get tested every year because of it. The AHERA law is a wonderful law, and it does protect us, but do not kid yourselves. We still need help, and this still does happen, and we still are getting exposed, and it has to stop. So from there, I'm going to let Rob take over and tell you where we're at now and the progress that we've made now from then. Why I was sand in, uh, I received a report from my supervisor, a report stating that the asbestos sampling or the dust sampling was negative for asbestos. But in this report, it mentioned about a home. It mentioned about a fire in the building and the report didn't make sense. Uh, that's when I got a hold of Teresa and we got a hold of the Michigan OSHA. Uh, their thought is this is a cut and paste type of report and it's a fraud report. Uh, and also the district was out of compliance from 1993 to 2012. They did not uh, keep up to date the asbestos management plan for the, for the schools. 
Uh, we were not given asbestos management classes until 16 years after I got hired in there. Uh, my kids went to summer school that year and I drove them home at lunchtime. I've even walked through the cafeteria at lunchtime with a bunch of dust on me, not realizing what was going on. Uh, and it plays a lot on your emotions. Right now we're trying to do better. The district is doing better because they've been forced to, not because they wanted to. And all this has been about is saving money for them. And that's all they cared about. They didn't care about the kids. They didn't care about the teachers and they didn't care about the workers. The only thing they cared about was money. And with the help of the SEIU, hopefully we can still stay on them because things aren't done yet. Things are still going on. We're still uncovering different things with asbestos tiles in different schools. And by maybe in a couple, three, four years, maybe things will get back to normal there. But right now there's still a lot of work to do in District 7 schools. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa and, and Rob. And I, they're, they're courageous workers and courageous union members because they spoke up, they challenged when they were told there was no problem here and they deserve our recognition. What they didn't say was that the, the retaliation that they faced, uh, attempted firings, shorted paychecks, uh, a, a disinformation campaign where their where their coworkers and parents are being told that asbestos is not dangerous, it doesn't exist anymore, it's not a problem, and so we're thrilled that they're here and able to hear from the experts and talk to the experts in this room as we try to move forward and, 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 and make the situation better. There is improvements happening, and so I know Rob and Teresa have talked about training is occurring, procedures are more in place, uh, materials are labeled, and so there's, there's some effort and we're going to try to keep pushing that forward. I think what it what to me it shows is the real value of, of, of workers being in unions because they have a voice to speak out with, with even though they're retaliated against, they're still here and they're still working. They're protected because of the union. Okay. Uh, they're more likely to file complaints because they know they have some protection and they even know that they can. And this local is gonna continue to, uh, to, pers to pursue this work and not only pursue it in this school district, but as Teresa and Rob mentioned, expand their the scope and the, and the capacity that they have to try to, to, try to uh, increase the awareness of this in other school districts that aren't doing the right thing. So, so a union approach is that we should prevent this just like ADAO and many of you say, we should be preventing these exposures so that there's no illnesses. Workers acting together can make conditions safer and we think it's really crucial that workers are participating fully with management in decision making and planning and, and had that been, had that been enacted many years ago, they wouldn't have dropped the whole program uh, 20, some, 20 some years ago. So here's some contact information for us. We're, I mean, we'll be glad to tell their story because you only heard a very brief piece of it. But uh, thank you so much for that and thanks for ADAO and everything you do.